Hello, and welcome to Microwave Near Field Imaging in Real Time with Professor Natalia Nikolova. I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcast, which is sponsored by the MTTS Education Committee. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. A recording should be posted approximately 24 hours after we finish the presentation. We'll send all registrants an email when the archived webinar goes up, so you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them after the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. Enter your questions in the Q&A box in the webcast window, and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge slides by clicking on the rectangle at the top right of the slide area. You can also go into full screen mode if you desire. Refresh or reload your current browser web page if you encounter any problems. With regards to audio, if you're listening over your computer speakers, you can adjust the media player volume. You may also need to adjust your, your system's master volume. Also, the icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a resource list. Clicking that link will start the process to download copies of the slides to be presented today. Now let's introduce our speaker. Professor Natalia Nikolova received the Diploma of Engineering degree in Radio Electronics from the Technical University of Varna in Bulgaria in 1989 and the PhD degree from the University of Electrocommunications in Tokyo, Japan in 1997. In 1999, she joined the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at McMaster University, where she is currently a professor. Her research interests include inverse scattering, microwave imaging, as well as computer-aided analysis and design of high-frequency structures and antennas. Professor Nikolova has served as a distinguished microwave lecturer, is a Canada Research Chair, a Fellow of the IEEE, and the Canadi Canadian Academy of Engineering. So now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Professor Natalia Nikolova for microwave near-field imaging in real time. Natalia? Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me well. Uh, this is Natalia, so let us start our lecture. Why do we care about microwave imaging? This technology allows for seeing through optically opaque barriers, such as clothing, walls, luggage, living tissue, soil, and many others. The lower the frequency is, generally, the better the penetration. But even with frequencies as high as hundreds of gigahertz, uh, we can use, e uh, easily penetrate through clothing, for example. Besides, uh, the electronics, especially in the low gigahertz range, has become affordable and compact. We now have whole radios and radar systems integrated on chips. Also, our community has by now at its disposal a diverse suite of efficient image reconstruction methods, which provide images within seconds. Microwave near-field imaging finds numerous applications in a variety of um, devices, such as whole body scanners, non-destructive testing through the wall imaging, medical imaging for diagnostics, such as cancer diagnostics, and, of course, ground-penetrating radar. An example of microwave near-field imaging in non-destructive testing and luggage inspection is provided by the wideband camera developed at the University of Missouri by Professor Zugi's team. You can see the camera in figure A. It consists of electronically switched array positioned over a small suitcase which holds a box cutter and a pair of scissors. In real time, a 3D image is obtained as shown in figure B. The camera can focus on the particular image slice for a better view of an object which lies in the plane of this slice. Figure C, for example, shows the slice image focused on the box cutter, whereas figure D is focused on the scissors. Let us see um, an excerpt of a YouTube video which demonstrates this real-time camera in action. You see the camera on the right with the antennas the hand of a person approaching. In real time, the image at the bottom left corner shows the hand. At the bottom, you see the uh, raw data. And the sliding bar adjusts the focusing of the plane. And now you can see very well in real time 
as the metallic objects are being turned around. So this is an excellent example of what real-time imaging is about. So um, another interesting application is in the detection of on-body concealed threats. The Pacific Northwest National Lab is well known for developing a number of near-field microwave imaging systems for this purpose, most of which employ circular or cylindrical scans. In real time, images are produced, such as those that you see in the slide. And um, you can see, for example, a water bottle clearly identified on the body of a mannequin, a handgun on the, on the leg, as well as something that looks like a knife, as well as in the middle image, you can observe a number of objects that are strapped to the back of the mannequin. Another interesting video demonstrates through wall imaging in real time using unmanned aerial vehicles or drones that circle around the brick structure while emitting and receiving Wi-Fi signals. Only the strength of the Wi-Fi signals is recorded, therefore no phase information is available. This interesting work has been done by the academic team of Professor Mostofi at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And uh, the brick structure and the enclosed objects are completely unknown. The drones Plus, are circling a around signal, the brick structure and, the other one measures and without the any prior information. Power. After no they prior measurements have been made in this area, and so data, the area is completely an image unknown of the interior to the emerges. And bearing in mind that there is no here's the top view of the unknown available, area of interest. The actual reconstruction and here is a 3D good, binary ground in the image, image of it on the right. The right figure then, then shows we must how acknowledge uh, image also the very uh, important applications of near field microwave imaging in medical diagnostics. There are a lot of teams are focusing on breast cancer detection and recently a few successful validations in clinical trials with patients have been reported in the imaging of breast tumors. In this slide, we see the results of uh, Professor Kikawa's team at uh, Hiroshima University in Japan. Their system uses, as you can see on the, in the images on the left, uh, electronically switched cross-shaped array of 16 slot antennas. The reconstruction uses delay and sum reconstruction method, which is the most widely used real-time approach to imaging with pulsed radar signals. Within seconds, the image of the tumor in an examination of a real patient is obtained as it is demonstrated in the uh, figures, the images to the right of the slide. Many near-field uh, microwave imaging systems are already in the commercial domain, such as the millimeter wave whole body imagers. The public is well aware of that as they're used by airport security. Also, a wide variety of handheld instruments uh, employing microwave radiation is av are available for home inspectors and contractors, detecting studs, pipe, and wiring, as is shown in the image uh, at the top right corner of the slide. And of course, we are all very well aware that there are many pe uh, ground penetrating radar systems available, and those are used to detect pipes, cables, tunnels, and other buried objects on the ground. So let us see how microwave imaging works. Um, of course, the main principle, we need abundant and diverse data. In other words, in order to image an object, first and foremost, we need to measure its radar response. Imaging needs lots of data. Moreover, the data must be diverse so that each data point adds complementary information to the one already provided by the other data points. Um, in space, for example, the abundance and diversity of data is ensured by illuminating the target from various angles, 
as well as collecting the scattered signals at various angles, even possibly distances. This is illustrated in the figure on the right, which shows the red transmitting antenna at the bottom, illuminating the scattering object and all other antennas arranged in a cylindrical fashion um, receive the scattered signal. In the next measurement, the transmitting antenna is now the one that is neighboring the transmitting, the, the, the transmitting one in the previous experiment, and again, all other antennas receive. And this is repeated to collect a large amount of data. Of course, this requires scanning, Scanning is typically performed on acquisition surfaces of canonical shapes, such as planar, cylindrical, or spherical, which makes the inversion easier. We employ both mechanical scanning and electronically switched arrays. Certainly, electronically switched arrays are much faster, but mechanical scanning has its advantages. Most importantly, it is very easy to set up because mechanical scanners are available for purchase and they have wonderful mechanical stability and very, very small sampling steps available. They are programmable and therefore they are allowed to adjust scan parameters as necessary, such as scan pattern as well as um, sampling step. Electronically switched arrays are difficult to develop and they are developed only as a final product uh, for a particular application and therefore their flexibility is somewhat limited. And this is why when we are developing an imaging uh, method, we very often uh, use mechanical scanning for validation and then only once we are sure that it will work, we proceed with a final electronically switched system. Now, um, as we said, um, a lot of data is good for imaging, but the data uh, also needs to be diverse. Oversampling does not necessarily ensure diversity, it only increases acquisition time. And we also need each sample to add complementary or in independent information. And that is because linearly dependent data may lead to an ill-posed inversion problem, uh, which may result in an erroneous image. So what we usually do is we stay below but very close to the maximum recommended spatial sampling step, delta X or delta Y if you wish, which as the formula in the middle of the screen shows depends on the minimum wavelength of the radiation as well as the maximum angle alpha at which the object can be seen. This maximum angle alpha is either the antenna beam width, omega A, as is shown in the figure on the right, or the angle that depends on the aperture extent and the distance to the target alpha A max, whichever is smaller. Now, in near field imaging, we should be cognizant of the fact that the effective wavelength may be much shorter than the wavelength in open space. And that is because in the near zone, fields tend to vary much more rapidly with position than in the far zone. And that is why the minimum effective wavelength is not necessarily determined by the the ratio that we all know, speed of light in the background medium divided by frequency. Actually, near field imaging, it is better to take a Fourier transform of the data and in inspect what is the spectral extent of the data, K max, and use this to determine from the data the um, effective minimum wavelength which uh, will determine an optimal choice of the spatial sampling step. Simple uh, and uh, simple formula exists also as a recommendation for the maximum recommended frequency sampling, that is in case we do frequency measurements. And again, we stay uh, close to this um, recommended maximum sampling step slightly below it. The formula is shown in the center of the slide, and as you can see, it is related to the length of the temporal record, T max, which in turn has to be long enough to allow for the signal to travel from the array 
to the most remote target point and back to the array. So it is tied actually to R max, the distance to the most remote object, uh, point in the imaged uh, domain. In the temporal sampling, when we do uh, time domain measurements, again, we have a recommended maximum time sampling step, and that is tied to the shortest period in the radiation, of course, through Nyquist criterion. In other words, we need to sample at least two times within this shortest period. So what is near field imaging and how is it distinct from far field imaging? Near field imaging is determined through the distance R from the object under test to the uh, imaging array or the acquisition surface. And if any of the three conditions below apply, then we are dealing with near field scenario. And this is when the distance is uh, smaller than the far zone of Fraunhofer in the boundary of the antennas. In other words, you're imaging objects in the near zone of the antennas. Or the uh, R is smaller, or the distance is smaller than the size of the imaged object, or the distance is smaller than the wavelength. So what are the implications when we are dealing with near zone imaging? The implications are that the field distributions are far more complicated than in the far zone. And they do not conform to free space far zone analytical propagation models as the one given at the bottom of the screen, which represents the field radiated by the antenna as a spherical wave corrected by the antenna gain pattern G, and possibly we may also know the polarization of the antenna given by its unit polarization vector P. So let us now examine the forward model of scattering that microwave reconstruction algorithms use. If we are measuring in the frequency domain, we are likely measuring scattering parameters using vector network analyzers, for example. And the figure at the bottom right of the slide shows one such experiment where transmitting antenna is attached to the case port and the receiving antenna is attached to the eyes port and the object with the antennas forms an N port network or NP port network and the S parameter S I K I receiving antenna K transmitting antenna is measured. Now the forward model of scattering in terms of S parameters is well known and it is shown in the formula at the top in the form of a volume integral and this uh, volume integral is over the volume Vs that accommodates the objects under test scattering volume. The constants in front of this integral are known. For example, AI and AK are the root power waves that are exciting the respective ports when these ports transmit. What is the object of reconstruction is the complex permittivity contrast delta epsilon r, which as the formula at the top right shows is nothing but the difference between the complex permittivity of the object that we're imaging and that of the background. So that's unknown. This is what we want to image. Then comes the Green's function, it's Green's vector function, and it, it can be shown that this is nothing but the incident internal field due to the receiving antenna if it were to operate as a transmitting antenna. We uh, refer to this as internal field because this is the field distribution inside the volume that accommodates objects under test, that is the volume Vs. We also refer to it as incident field because this is actually the field distribution when this volume is void of scatters. There are no scatters in it. In contrast, the uh, field that is due to the transmitting antenna, EK, has to be the total field. And total means that this is the field in, in the volume when the object under test is in it. 
So let us now see what we know and what we don't know in this forward model of scattering. Well, obviously on the right, we have the data, the S parameters, and for now we will assume that we know it, although of course it is also corrupted by noise, uncertainties, etc. as we're not gonna talk about this today. Uh, then we have the contrast in magenta, um, and this is the unknown. Uh, Green's vector function, we will assume that we know it. We have to. Uh, of course, there is a big question mark how accurately we know it. And that is because in the near zone, the far zone, analytical approximations in the form of spherical or locally plane waves don't work very well. Not to mention that in the near zone, the field polarization is particularly complicated and we don't really know it. Beside, and most importantly, the proximity of the object under test to an antenna, as well as components of the setup close to the antenna change its performance compared to that in open space. And therefore, very often we resort to simulating those incident field distributions in the setup in the absence of objects under test and use those to calculate the Green's vector. Even simulations are, however, not quite accurate because they suffer from modeling errors. Modeling errors, by the way, don't have um, anything to do with numerical errors. Um, your simulation can be fully convergent and yet the result may be inaccurate simply because we are unable to represent all detail in, details in the measurement setup, such as enclosures, absorbers, struts, supporting materials, etc. So let us now uh, talk a little bit about the total field. Because the total field is the one in the presence of the imaged object, it is an implicit function of the uh, permittivity contrast, which renders the integral equation at the top a nonlinear equation in the unknown. So microwave imaging is intrinsically a nonlinear problem. Now, in real-time imaging, we usually linearize this model. And for that, we use Born's approximation, which replaces the total field with its incident counterpart. In other words, the field that would exist if the object were not there. As you can imagine, this is a big assumption. And um, this assumption, though, allows us to um, construct a very simple linear forward, well, not very simple, but much simpler than the nonlinear problem. What you see in this slide at the top is the forward model of scattering in terms of S parameters with frequency domain measurements, where now the integral equation kernel is completely independent of the contrast. By the way, I will only mention briefly that a sim similar linear model of scattering exists in the time domain. The only difference is that the kernel is obtained by convolving the impulse response of the system to the um, uh, receiving antenna when this antenna radiates in the absence of an object and the um, field of the transmitting antenna, again, as an incident field with a linear approximation. So this is how the model is linearized, but of course we should be cognizant that this assumption that we can replace the total field with the incident field is subject to limitations on both the size and the contrast of the scatter. These are known as the total internal field uh, limitations for the Born's approximation. And as the formula shows, uh, both the size and the contrast of the scatter have to be small. We say that Born's approximation holds in the case of weak scatters. Here A is the radius of the smallest sphere circumscribing the uh, scatter. K sub S is uh, the wave number of scatter and KB that of the background. So what if we violate these limits? Uh, well, if these limits are violated, the images will contain artifacts which do not reflect the real contrast in the object. They just reflect the differences or our errors that arise from us assuming that the field is that of the incident field, whereas it is actually the total field. 
So let us now see how one particular real-time reconstruction method um, works on such models. Uh, holography is probably one of the simpler ones. Holography uh, refers to a group of reconstruction methods that use both the magnitude and phase of the scattered waves recorded at the surface or surfaces to produce a 3D image in a single inversion step. As an example, the um, figure on the left is showing two antennas scanning two planes, number one and number two. At any given measurement, one antenna transmits and the receiving antenna, which is aligned with the transmitting antenna along bore site, receives. So at every position, we can measure both reflected signals, possibly, as well as transmitted signals. These are S parameters, S11, S22, S21. But we can also measure cross-polarized signals as well, provided we have enough space to put additional antennas. We can also scan in frequency and obtain n omega frequency samples. So actually, at every scan position, we can obtain quite a large number of responses that can give us a lot of independent information about the target. So let us now see how holography discretizes its forward model and solves it. First of all, we're going to lose these IK subscripts and we're going to replace them with the index Xi, which simply denotes the type of response. For example, if we have only two antennas facing each other, we can have three types of responses, two reflection coefficients and one transmission coefficient. Type of responses will grow if if we add cross-pole signals, for example, or more antennas. Also, you will see that um, we have here the S parameters uh, as a function of position. Well, of course, this is the scan position. And the scan position reflects the position of both, the transmitting and receiving antenna pair. Please note that during the scan, the transmitting and the receiving antennas in a pair are fixed with respect to each other, which means that if we know the position of the receiving antenna, we also know the position of the transmitting antenna, as is illustrated in the scenario above, where if we know the position of antenna number one or antenna number two, which is the receiving one in this example, then antenna number one, we know is simply translated along the z-axis by d. So let us now look at the kernel. This is called referred to as the resolvent kernel of the integral equation that we have to solve in order to recover delta epsilon r, our unknown contrast. So this is, of course, the approximate Born resolvent kernel. And now holography makes a big assumption. And the assumption is that the resolvent kernel is translationally invariant in the directions of the scan, that is, for example, x and y. Of course, this is true if the background is uniform or layered in x and y. And uh, this is illustrated with the figure on the right, where the blue antennas uh, indicate position at the center of the scanned aperture. We need the incident field produced by the transmitting and receiving antennas at this position. Let us assume we know it. And this is the field indicated with the subscript zero. Now, if the antennas are shifted to another XY position, because of the assumption that the background is uniform or layered, we know that the incident field will be translated together with the antennas. So this is what it means that the kernel is translationally invariant. The kernel is, of course, uh, computed from the incident field. So if the incident fields are translationally invariant, then the kernel is translationally invariant. Now, the holography forward model involves um, an integral that starts to look like a convolution, but not yet. First, let, us, uh, let me give you some examples of this um, resolvent kernel so that you have be a better idea what's the physical meaning. Uh, for example, in the far zone, we use analytical resolvent kernels. We already spoke about how they could be represented as spherical waves or locally plane waves. And let's say we have reflection data, in which case, of course, we're assuming that the transmitting and receiving antennas are the same. And 
and then the dot product of the field with itself, if we care only about the phase of the radiation, can be represented as a locally plane wave as shown with the first line of formulas. Notice the factor of 2 multiplying the wave number, which is due to the fact that you have the field squared. Of course, spherical approximations can be used as well. Unfortunately, far field kernels don't work very well with near field data and it is recommended that we either simulate them and we said that this may also often fail or even better, just measure them. So near field kernels are best determined through the measurement of the system point spread function. The point spread function is the system response to a point scatter. And the measurement of a point spread function is illustrated in the figure on the right, where an electrically small scattering probe is positioned at the center of the imaged volume V sub S, and a measurement is taken of all types of responses that we want, and at all frequencies. So as it turns out, look at the formula at the bottom, the point spread function is exactly equal to the kernel of the uh, holography forward model, only with the sign of the variables x and y swapped. But this is exactly what we want, because when we now substitute in the forward model of holography, what we obtain is a 2D convolution in these scanned variables x and y, between the unknown contrast and the point spread function of the system. Convolution immediately implies that we can perform very efficiently calculation in Fourier space because the 2D convolution is a simple multiplication. At each point in Fourier space, we refer to this point as the kappa point. This um, is in Fourier space with coordinates kx and ky. And then find the final discretization step of the model of holography is to break down the integral along range or depth, that is the z-integral, into a sum. And now finally, we have a discretized equation at each point in Fourier space that relates data um, acquired for, for different responses. This is the subscript psi for different frequencies. This is the superscript m. Um, and now we are dealing with an unknown, which is um, the uh, Fourier transform, 2D Fourier transform along x and y of the unknown contrast in real space. So now this discrete form of the equation allows for writing a fairly small system of equations at each point in Fourier space. Here Fourier space is discretized, each point in Fourier space is denoted as kappa ij. Um, the number of samples in Fourier space is typically comparable or the same as that in real space. So we solve nx, ny such systems where nx and ny are the number of sampling steps along our apertures on the order of uh, several tens to hundreds of thousands. However, we, so we solve um, such many such systems, but each system is very small. Number of types of responses is anywhere between 1 to 3. Number of frequencies is anywhere between and maybe 100. Number of range locations in near zone imaging is 3 to 5 to 10 maximum. So these are relatively small systems of equations which solve incredibly fast. So even though you have to solve 10,000 or 100,000 of those, typical execution times are 2 to 3 seconds on a laptop using unoptimized MATLAB um, codes. And this solution is orders and orders of magnitude faster than solving for uh, 100 millions of unknowns in real space. So this is the great advantage, computational advantage of holography, which in, in effect applies a divide and conquer strategy by breaking down a very large problem into a large amount of very small linear systems of equations. So once we reconstruct in the Fourier space, we, using inverse Fourier transform, we go back to real space, find the contrast, provided that we know what the background medium is, we can reconstruct the complex permittivity of the object.
So um, one more note. Uh, so far, we have uh, implicitly assumed that we actually measure the scattered portion of the data or the S parameters with frequency domain measurements. Well, that is not really the case. What we measure is a total response in the sense that this response um, contains um, a signal that would exist even in the absence of the object under test. We refer to the signal as the incident field portion of the S parameter. And it also, of course, contains the contribution from the scattering object. So um, we actually need to perform an additional, call it a calibration measurement, where we measure the respective response in the absence of a scatter. This gives us as incident, the incident portion of the signal. Then we measure the object under test, which gives us as total. And then according to Born's expansion, we can simply subtract the um, incident portion from the total portion to obtain the scattered portion which we need. So Born's expansion of the data essentially assumes that there is a linear superposition uh, between uh, the signals that are obtained in the absence of the object under test and that with the object. However, there is another uh, expansion strategy, and that is Ritov's expansion strategy, which is a logarithmic one. We don't have much time to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each extraction technique, uh, but I would only mention that as the limitations on the right are showing, uh, Born's expansion is sensitive to the size of the scatterer. If the size of the scatterer is too large, there will be errors in this um, subtraction technique, uh, whereas Ritov's expansion is sensitive to the, um, it is insensitive to the size of the object, but it is more sensitive than Born to um, large contrasts. Let us look at some examples. We've got, this is an experiment that we carried out some years ago in my lab. We are imaging two metallic crosses with an X-band um, uh, open-end waveguide transmitting from below in an array of five such waveguides receiving above. Uh, the table in the top right shows what is the wavelength, what is the far zone limit of the antennas. Uh, you can also see the, the positioning of all these components in millimeters in the figure on the left, and you can appreciate that we are working truly in the very near reactive zone of these antennas. Um, the photo in the middle shows the setup before the cables are hooked up, and the photo on the right shows the measured crosses cut out from copper type, and you also see that we have cut out a small circle to serve as a scattering probe. We initially simulated the incident fields of these um, antennas, and as you can see, with the simulated kernel, we did not um, achieve very good images. However, with um, the measurement of the uh, scattering probe, we can uh, readily obtain much better images. And these images also conform very well with the expected spatial resolution. The spatial resolution in an image indicates what is the smallest geometrical detail that we can recover. And our calculations show that the lateral resolution should be around four millimeters, which is indeed the case. Our uh, cross-shaped objects have arms of width around five millimeters, and those are represented very well in the images. The depth resolution for the bandwidth available to us is estimated at 10 millimeters, and you can indeed see that the 3D image shows that around 10 millimeters away from the cross, they are only weak artifacts. Now, talking about resolution, um, do we have get guidelines that can tell us what is the best resolution that we can achieve? Indeed, we do. And the, the formulas are shown in this slide. And as you can see, both the lateral resolution along X and Y and the depth resolution along Z, they both critically depend on the effective minimum wavelength of the radiation, especially in the range resolution. This ties up also with the bandwidth 
width of the re radiation B, which is in the uh, denominator. But I would like to point out here something important. If you want to achieve this sort of resolution, which is the optimal one, the best you can do, you need wide viewing angles of uh, the targets, and these are critically. This is critically important. So that is why we use wide beam antennas and large scanned apertures. So coming back to the um, uh, previous example with the wideband microwave camera for real-time imaging of Professor Zugi's team, you can see that. Um, even though the camera is focused on the box cutter, for example, in the image of C, you can still see somewhat the scissors as well as the button of the suitcase, which is the little bright dot in the middle. Um, yet you can see quite a bit of detail in this image. Of course, with microwave images, we can never show the detail that you can get with your eyes, as is the box cutter and the uh, scissors are shown in the top left image. But of course, that is because our eyes use much shorter <laughs> wavelengths, the optical wavelengths. And let me show you here a quick example, an experiment that one of my graduate students carried out with uh, tissue imaging. And uh, he prepared uh, here a uh, chicken wing. Uh, which he immersed in uh, peanut butter and jam, which is used simply to uh, remove all air between the chicken wing and the host medium, which is carbon rubber. All these materials, by the way, all these tissue uh, samples actually have been measured for their um, complex permittivity, and you can see that the values in the table on the right. So chicken wing has bone, skin, muscle, and uh, as you can see, the contrast between all these uh, or among all these uh, tissues is very high, and we definitely are violating. Um, the limitations of Born's approximation for the total field, but nonetheless, uh, we they measured point spread function. Here, the measurement is shown in um, the image. You see that we use the carbon rubber sheets as um, embedding medium. The small scattering probe is clearly seen at the, at the center, and with this measurement, we actually achieve. Uh, quite good images of this tissue sample uh, that show um, resolution, lateral resolution of around uh, four millimeters. You can clearly see in the image of the, um, neg of the imaginary part of the permittivity, the bones in the middle, running in the middle of the chicken. This is the rightmost image. Uh, these are fairly thin, two bones, and you can definitely resolve them. The um, real part of the permittivity also shows where the tissues are with the highest real permittivity correctly. This is the skin to the left and the muscle to the right. The quantitative information, of course, is not very accurate. However, it represents accurately which tissues have higher losses, which tissues have lower losses, like bone has lower loss than muscle. and. Um, so from that point of view, even in real time, one can obtain fairly accurate information. So um, um, unfortunately, time is running out. So I would like to wrap up this lecture by saying that we have just grazed the surface of an extensive yet very fascinating subject. Real-time microwave imaging is a rapidly growing research and technological area. And a lot of research teams are working on improving the hardware, more specifically developing antennas for particular applications, as well as trying to integrate the necessary electronics on a chip. Uh, a lot of work is going on on new calibration methods, and perhaps most of the researchers are working on new inversion methods. I would like also to mention that I did not have time to explain how synthetic focusing works, which is another major tool in our real-time inversion toolbox, especially when we deal with pulsed or time-dependent signals.
So um, these methods and many more are described in the introductory text that I published last year with Cambridge University Press and my team and I also maintain a web page given at the bottom of this slide where we have posted MATLAB codes that implement holography that we just discussed, scattered power mapping, another real-time inversion methods, method for frequency domain data, delay and sum or synthetic focusing method, and a couple of denoising algorithms. And we keep updating. So please feel free to visit and uh, try out these codes. Thank you for your attention. And I will be glad to answer any questions. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Uh, so one quick note here uh, for the uh, for the audience members that are looking for um, the PDH code to do to get the professional development hours. Um, I noticed that that code is not actually included on the slides here. So um, please just go ahead and submit a question and you know just saying that you need that code and we'll respond back to you to get that code out to you. Apologies for that. Um, okay, so. Uh, Let's see, on to our questions here. Uh, and, and before we start that, please also remember that there's still time to submit your questions. Uh, make sure you submit those through the Q&A panel uh, and click, click Submit so that we can get a hold of those. But now's your chance to get your questions in. Um, OK, so here we've got a, a few questions here. Um, so what types of antennas are being used for, uh, for near-field imaging uh, systems? Um, the antennas uh, for near-field systems are typically actually um, designed to radiate the way we design any other antenna uh, in open space. Uh, that is what we usually do. That is because, after all, we do need radiation coming out of these antennas. In other words, let me put it this way, we do not design reactive um, antennas. We do design them to be matched to a 50 ohm lo load. We do want them to radiate as much as possible. The specificity of the antennas, in other words, the, the way we design antennas for far zone imaging very often applies the same design principles to near zone imaging. Um, although, of course, we have to take care of mutual coupling and things like that. But to make a very important role, um, we absolutely need to design the antenna for best performance in the respective medium. And here what comes in mind is tissue imaging. Uh, the design of antennas for tissue imaging is particularly tricky. And that is because they are supposed to work in a medium which is the tissue medium, which is very heterogeneous. There is a big interface between very sharp interface in terms of contrast between the tissue and the air, et cetera, et cetera. But other than that, the design principles are pretty much the same. OK, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's one on, um, does this just work on static objects, or could it be used on, for example, a living heart? I think we saw some video with, with, with motion in there. But I guess let's rephrase that as, what are some of the limitations on the real-time aspect? Um, well, um, in fact, these codes that you, uh, the examples that you saw, particularly the SAR imaging of Professor Zugi's uh, team, uh, holography, the, these are the uh, whole body scanners. Um, once they're implemented on an FPGA, um, uh, these, these codes run instantaneously. So a fraction of a second, I would say, certainly not microseconds, but definitely within half a second, a uh, tenth of a second, and you should be able to see uh, a whole body image with the weapons, for example, on the body. So now, as far as tissue is concerned, um, and the motion of the heart or breathing, well, that is a different story. I don't know whether the speed would be sufficient. OK, yeah, and that was actually the specifics of the question was, the example they asked was on, on, on a living heart, a beating heart. Never never seen an application that um, was capable of doing that. 
Um, I don't know whether it is, I don't think here the code or the speed of the code would be the problem. Here the problem would be the linearizing approximations. Getting those microwaves down to the heart and back up with sufficient signal to noise ratio would be very tricky. So the linearizing approximations that the real-time imaging uh, uses may be a big problem here. Okay, great. Uh, Let's see, here's a question about polarization. Would circular polarization be better than linear polarization? Uh, uh, it depends on the application. Um, for example, um, it is well known that um, if you want to um, uh, focus on the specular reflection, that is a, a reflection from an object that is electrically large, um, if you use a circularly polarized antenna, in uh, the reflection that comes from a man, for example, or a metallic object will be actually oppositely polarized. If you're transmitting with right-hand circularly polarized antenna, what will come back to you is left-hand circularly polarized signal. If you want the signal, then you better use a left-hand circularly polarized antenna when you receive. On the other hand, if you're looking for um, to suppress that specular reflection and only focus on the cross pole, then you better receive with right-hand circularly polarized antenna. In other words, the antenna same as your transmitting antenna. So yeah, there are there are a lot of tricks out there that exploit uh, polarization diversity, and the, the guys at um, the uh, Pacific Northwest Lab um, are describing them quite well in, in their papers. Yep, I'm done. Okay. okay. Um, so back to the, uh, the, the living tissue aspect, is there any effect of uh, neuroelectrical activity in the body on, on those measurements? Not to my knowledge, no. Um, what the, the focus has been uh, entirely on uh, cancer detection, not entirely, but um, in the majority of applications, um, cancer detection, bone treatment, brain um, disease, uh, as well as lung diseases. Um, in other words, all medical diagnostics. As for electrical activity, no, I have not heard of anything like that. That is not to say that there isn't, um, but not to, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Okay. So, so similarly, I think this, this fits into the same vein. Is there research being done on using this, um, uh, these methods to, to do material type detection or material exploration, uh, specifically on oh, the yes. side? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, you saw even the wideband camera of uh, Professor Zugi's team. Um, that's exactly what these things do. If, um, let me try and go back to some of the slides. Um, for material inspection, for example, um, maybe this slide, yeah. Um, this Wallabot, uh, for example, this is a typical uh, device that you attach to your cell phone and you're inspecting materials. Uh, Professor Zugi's camera is also demonstrated in the journal paper, I believe, not in the video, on, on finding, for example, air pockets in, in materials. So yeah, this is actually a major application. Yes, I'm done. It's like it would have all kinds of, all kinds of uses. Oh, okay, all so kinds question, of uses, yeah. All kinds of uses, yeah. So question on the chicken wing experiment. Why do you think good experimental results are obtained, even though we certainly have violated Born's approximation? In general, how much, quote, mileage can we expect to get with this method beyond the weak scattering approximation? Okay, so we are talking about these results. Um, I think that... Um, the results are sufficiently good because this sample is fairly thin. It is only, uh, in other words, in range, we have a very simple structure. Only in the lateral direction, it is very complex. And if you add more, uh, let's say, another chicken wing behind that one or, or something else behind the chicken wing, and you're going to start um, seeing the, the two um, 
images merging into one, a lot of uh, you will lose resolution in depth. And this loss of resolution in depth is not only due to, uh, let's say, insufficient bandwidth, but it is actually due to uh, problems with the um, accuracy of the uh, approximation. Um, I must say that the uh, measurement of the point spread function um, indeed pushes the application beyond the Born approximation. Um, and yet, um, nobody has, to my knowledge, has actually published an explanation why that is. In other words, in near field imaging, if you uh, measure the point spread function and use that in the kernel, uh, although the point spread function theoretically represents a linearized kernel, um, it still performs um, well even if the Born approximation of the total internal field is um, violated. So um, there is still work on this to be done and, and explain why is it that um, this can, images like this can be actually achieved when uh, the Born approximation is clearly violated. Right, okay. So along the, the, the same lines of having to measure the point spread function, there are a couple questions about uh, for each new target, do you need a new point spread function to be measured? No, no, absolutely not. As long as you know what is the host medium, your VS, um, like for example, we decided in this chicken wing example that the host medium is the carbon rubber. We could have decided, and we have images like this, where the PBJ, the, the, that dielectric scattering probe is embedded in peanut butter and jam. And it does work. Um, it changes the um, quantitative output for the real and the imaginary part of the permittivity, but uh, the relative strength of those is uh, always comes out correct. So no, you do not have to. If you're measuring in air, you have to, for example, um, you have to measure the point spread function only once in air, and then you can go ahead and uh, measure all sorts of objects that are in air. So okay. it's, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we may, let's try to squeeze in one or two more questions here. And, and also, uh -huh. just to remind the audience members that maybe didn't catch that earlier, uh, if you need the code for the PDH hours, please submit uh, through the Q&A panel uh, and just say, please send us the, the code, just a reminder of that there. Um, okay, so could these techniques be used to monitor the progress of microwave heating or cooking? Uh, well, why not? Um, it is well known that the electrical properties of materials upon heating change. Uh, they change particularly drastically in living tissue. Um, uh, that is meat, wood, when it turns from, from uh, wet to dry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, if the electrical properties change, then yeah, microwave imaging can monitor this. And uh, the um, only problem would be, in my opinion, how would you deploy your imaging system um, in, say, a microwave oven? Uh, but other than that, the principle, yes, it can work. As, as the properties change, as the tissues, for example, or the material heats up, and its uh, permittivity changes, certainly this can be imaged in real time. Yes? Okay, excellent. And short answer, uh, if you got it, if you, if you can, um, otherwise we'll just have to close things out, but is there a preferred type of modulation for the transmitting signal? Uh, in, uh, in time domain measurements, uh, there definitely a pulse shaping is um, desirable in many applications. For example, you can reduce clutter by coding your signal. Um, you can do time gating by properly gating, by shaping your signal, thereby cutting reflections from objects that you don't want to detect or image compared to others. So yeah, absolutely, pulse shaping is a big subject in signal processing, imaging, and detection. Yeah, yes. Excellent, that's, that's great, that's fantastic. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, afraid we are out of time. 
there are still a number of questions. Sorry, sorry we didn't get to those that are in the queue, uh, but the presenter will follow up uh, with those unanswered questions offline. Uh, as we said earlier, this session will be archived on the Society website at mtt.org. Um, all the registrants will get an email reminder with the website address when that is available. Uh, also, last few seconds here, if you need the PDH credits, uh, submit that through the Q&A uh, so that we have your information and can get you the PDH credits. Once again, I'd like to thank Professor Nikolova for this really excellent and informative presentation. Special thanks also to our audience today. We hope you found today's event valuable and that you will return for future IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcasts. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, everyone.